Good evening. Hello. Uh, welcome to our fourth conference of the INSEAD uh, alumni series of this year. Um, this, is, this is also the fifth uh, conference, yearly conference, uh, which was started by, by Jean-Marc or six even, uh, Jean-Marc and myself uh, six years ago. Um, our first three conferences this year uh, were really uh, like today, spot on, on what is really actual at the moment. The first one was the next normal uh, business perspectives, uh, which was based on a, on, a, on a pool which was done to, uh, with a lot of alumni, alums, INSEAD alums. Um, the second one was uh, uh, leadership for sustainability, which you know, obviously is a subject with, which is of most importance in the future, we just talked about it when we talked about with Mark Dixon about his vineyards and about his domains. The third one was inclusive leadership, which also becomes amazingly important at the moment. And here we are in our today's conference, which is new technologies and future of work. It looks like it's, it's a nice ending of this first series and the next series will be next year and we'll talk about it at the end. Um, we, are, we are proud to present you a very special group of speakers um, from INSEAD, um, from KPMG. They will be all presented to you from KPMG, from Microsoft, from IWG or, or Rigos in the, in the past, from the International Labor Organization and some other alums of INSEAD. Um, we, we are pleased and we want to thanks, thank uh, um, uh, our sponsor today, um, KPMG, hey, when you, uh, you know, and, and Jean-Marc was part of G uh, KPMG and who was our former president and our actual president of the, since a few weeks of, the, of our association, you have 44 millions of results on audit, on council, on, on, on consulting, and on uh, expertise, uh, accounting expertise. Thank you, KPMG. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about KPMG at the end because they are also sponsoring the resume and the best of all these four conferences in the next few days. Um, let me introduce now no, the next thing is the webinar etiquette. Um, in fact, Peter talked a little bit about it. Audience is muted with video off and chat box disabled for, for all the people who are listening. Please use Q&A uh, for the questions. There will be questions answered during the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. If you have any technical issues, uh, please contact uh, at inciadalumni.fr and, and we will try to keep the conversation uh, flowing. Um, let me now introduce um, uh, the, the first speaker um, for, this, for this conference, which is called, which is New Technologies and Future of Work. In fact, it really is, is a summary of, of what we have done in the last three um, conferences. And, um, and, and Solène, uh, Solène is an, an, an alumna, an alumna of INSEAD. Um, she was CEO, CFO, and CEO of, of, tech, of tech Scales Up um, in emerging countries. She acts as an executive coach to better align business and societal interest. And uh, I'm glad to introduce Solen. The floor is yours, Solen. Thank you very much, Thomas. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce this fourth Essentials today. So the objective is to discuss indeed how digital and, it, and automation technologies may impact future of work and how to make sure it remains a force for good. 
so the question was actually one of the top uh, topic of interest uh, that were reported by uh, our fellow alumni, alumni um, in June uh, when we did the survey uh, while launching the Future of Work Club uh, in the INSEAD Alumni Association. And we feel today it's even more interesting and important to discuss uh, this subject in the context of uh, the current ec economical and uh, sanitary crisis, which accelerates uh, digital transformation and fully changes the way we work. So before we start, uh, Adeline uh, will launch a quick poll to better assess with you all how technologies are already impacting our jobs and work environments. We should, see, we should see the question pop up on the screen. Yes. So the question here uh, is how are digital and automation technologies impacting existing jobs in your organization? Impact is very limited. New technologies will mostly impact how we work, but not the workforce com composition itself. I expect new technologies to drastically change the composition of our workforce at operational and technical levels mainly, or I expect them to drastically change uh, at all levels. We we'll have 30 seconds, I, I believe, to answer. Great, thank you. So it's a quite uh, a diverse answer, but uh, we mostly agree that uh, technologies will have uh, an impact and already have uh, that the changes are already happening today. You will see in the chat as well, we asked a question on who va, but if we think that uh, technologies are today a force for good, uh, and so here we see as well that 42% of us are very confident, uh, but then, um, uh, 60% 60 are uh, somewhat uh, less confident. So uh, it's clear that we expect changes uh, following uh, new tech. Uh, and actually, a recent study estimated that 50% of our current work activities are already uh, automatable uh, if we adapt current technologies. So how do we prepare uh, as business leaders? Before we launch uh, the panel with our great, great uh, guest uh, of the day, I'm happy to welcome uh, to welcome Cécile de Courtray and Philippe Bavallo from uh, KPMG. Uh, they both kindly accepted uh, to share with us tonight the results of a sur recent survey they performed on Future of Work. So Cécile uh, is a partner in charge of the Future of Work and Change Management, management Activity for KPMG France. She has more than 20 years of experience at KPMG and she, focuses, she has been focusing for the last 10 years in supporting her clients in implementing new ways of working and in, man and in managing change. Uh, Philippe has 20 years of consulting experience. He's a partner in charge of the HR consulting activity at KPMG France. Thank you both to be here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Solène. Uh, and hello to, to everyone. So Philippe and I are very delighted to, uh, to spend some, uh, some time with you um, speaking uh, about uh, future of work. Very interesting topic. Um, so the, the COVID crisis has accelerated some, uh, some trials uh, already uh, present before. Um, but when we talk about uh, future of work, um, we, we, we really see four main priorities. So if you can move to the next slide. Uh, so firm, yes, the next one. <laughs> so four main priorities that are the top of the uh, CIO uh, agenda. Um, so first one is um, uh, how do we build a sustainable and a purpose-led uh, organization? Uh, second one is focused on developing new ways of working. Uh, third one is how to prepare the future by rethinking the workforce strategy. Are you pointing this point just uh, in, the, in the question raised uh, just before? 
and how to uh, to transform HR to be to better support the, the business. So we will deep dive on these uh, on these four trends in the in the coming uh, minutes. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, um, first interesting percentage is that um, seventy seven percent of uh, CEOs um, say that uh, the purpose of uh, their organization really helps them to better understand their, their stakeholders. So either internal or, or external stakeholders of their organization. And on top of that, 63% of them um, re, uh, said and shared with us that the COVID crisis has reinforced their focus on the social part of their uh, ESG program. So yes, really, sustainability and positive impact are really hot topics uh, for most of CEOs. And we really see that uh, actually on the market, uh, where we see that um, the uh, most forward thinking organization are reinventing their, uh, their business operating model, taking into account this, uh, this uh, positive impact. Um, but also what we see um, with our clients is that if the intention and speeches uh, are there, most of the organization are not yet fully transformed. They are only at the beginning of this, uh, of this journey. And uh, what they faced is really to, to move from intention to actions uh, and uh, be able to uh, reconcile the objective of uh, the financial and, uh, and economic resilience uh, with the objective uh, of making a positive contribution to, to people, to the society, and to, and to the environment. And the, the clients that are really, and the, the organizations that are really started this, uh, this journey to, to, to build a, a more sustainable and a, and a, and a positive uh, impact organization, I would say they are working current, currently on a reinventing uh, their purpose uh, in terms of organization. Um, but it's then how uh, this reinvented purpose, this new purpose, will feed the values of, uh, of the company, uh, will feed also the strategic plan and the strategic decision behind, uh, meaning um, do I need to sell some activities that are no more aligned uh, with this uh, new purpose? Uh, and it should also, uh, at some point, um, uh, reinvent our question, uh, question uh, the new ways of working of the uh, of the organization. This is really a, a key topic. Also, these new ways of working. So, if we move to the next slide, and I will over to to Philip to um, to share some uh, some key points on that. Thank you, Cecile. Um, so, uh, as Cecile mentioned, um, the second priority is about new ways of working. Huh? So that's clearly at the top of the agenda of CEOs and CHROs. We will come to the CHROs priority later, but typically a critical topic, and especially considering the crisis we are currently facing with COVID-19. And if we speak about technology, there are two aspects we want to share with you uh, today. First, uh, the topic about uh, remote, uh, remote work and huh, becoming a kind of new normal in the way uh, organizations are, are working now. And uh, probably we'll start sharing a, a few figures with you. First, um, the extent of this remote work in the day-to-day -day life of, of workers. Uh, so a study showed that uh, before COVID-19, we had approximately 3.6% of uh, workers working remotely. And after the COVID crisis, and we know it can change with the different uh, evolution we'll see uh, now in the crisis, it could move to 25 or 30%. But when we speak about this remote work and leveraging as a technology, what is interesting to see is also the extent of this remote work. Based on what we see at our clients, uh, many French-based clients uh, having uh, global headquarters in France, what we see is, a, is a, a move to approximately two days a week of remote work. So it means that there will be a need for new technology to really enable a more streamlined, a more, uh, let's say, efficient work on a day-to-day -day basis. But outside of this first um, uh, vision on, on the remote working and the impact of workers for, for, for the way they work and their day-to-day -day life at work, uh, it's also interesting to see what is the impact for a company, because it's not only a different way to organize themselves, it's also savings first. That's uh, what a, a study showed is uh, almost $11,000 per person per year uh, for companies that allow 50% um, of their time working from home. So, huge uh, savings to be considered. And also, and linked to what Cecile explained about the uh, 
uh, sustainability uh, topics uh, also uh, um, um, a move to uh, a reduce of the carbon footprint. So a mix of savings, of course, from a pure financial perspective, but also, uh, let's say, a, a move to a, a more uh, inclusive and more sustainable organizations through a reduction of the carbon footprint. So that's uh, really uh, several topics that's part of this remote working and uh, the impact of technology towards this, this evolution. Perhaps we can move now to uh, the second part. So I said remote working being the first uh, pillar huh, of this evolution. And the second one, and that also, uh, uh, let's say, imply a lot of uh, benefit, uh, not only financial, but also in terms of efficiency, the automation, or what we can call the digital labor. Um, again, uh, as part of the study, what we identify is a, a real, um, uh, real uh, huge potential in terms of automation. And Solen explained that at the very beginning. And we, if we deep dive on two, uh, two uh, let's say, functions, uh, when it comes to the customer service, uh, the assessment is that 30% of the task can be automated. When it comes to finance and payroll, uh, the estimate is around 44% of operation being automated. And I will just take the example of what we see at some of our clients. Huh? Uh, if you consider HR clients, we have a strong move of uh, payroll operation being automated on a task as controls. Payroll controls that was very time consuming tasks are almost now always automated thanks to robots. So that's a clear move of companies really to automate more and more the task of this uh, support function or customer function. Um, and we have at the bottom of the slide a few examples uh, of what we see today. Uh, and you can expand that in, in your day to day life, uh, having all these uh, administrative tasks, uh, um, uh, let's say a very uh, time consuming task, like handling uh, customer queries on, over the phone, that will be transformed ready, uh, drastically thanks to chatbots, AI that will uh, reduce uh, the administrative tasks for, uh, for agents, for uh, operational uh, agents. Uh, and focusing them on what we could uh, call added value task. Uh, really this move from uh, administrative tasks to um, more added value task. Uh, so that this clear move we see uh, at, at most of our clients now really uh, leveraging on the technology, AI, robots, uh, chatbots, uh, RPA to uh, really focus the agent on uh, the uh, most added value task. If we move to the next slide uh, and probably having a, a more uh, holistic vision of what it means huh, for, for organization. Um, the change I mentioned, remote working uh, automation, uh, that are two aspects of this uh, new ways of working, bring uh, several questions when it comes to future of work, future of technology, future of workplace. I will not comment every question I trace, but it could illustrate you well what uh, companies, organization face. But if we come, we start with future of work, there will be a huge, um, uh, huge focus of companies on what roles can be done very virtually. What will be the sh breakdown of responsibility between robots and uh, humans? How we will uh, articulate the work uh, between these two, uh, two actors all along the, the, the chain? Uh, how, and that's the third question in the future of work, how uh, we will rethink engagement, uh, remote working, productivity and performance leveraging on all these technologies. So really rethinking completely team management, remote working. Uh, it was already the case for, for, let's say, multinational teams, but now it's become also uh, concrete and really uh, true for uh, teams being uh, uh, in, a, in a given country. Future of technology, same. Uh, so we will see a lot of topics around employee experience. Huh? How can the technology bring a different experience and bring a different level of engagement for employees, managers, and the different function? and how the technology will evolve, will be uh, rethink without uh, to better support all this evolution across the organization. And future of workplace, huh? because uh, you know that's a common topic for a lot of uh, organization, how we will rethink uh, the uh, office space. Uh, you see, I'm today at the office because we need to, to, to be at the office for some collaborative work, innovation work, for some meetings needing really interaction between people, but there will be a complete uh, review of how we will rethink the uh, workplace and the organization of the uh, office space. Um, so that's typically the three uh, topics, the three areas we see uh, clients and organization uh, uh, addressing in the in the recent years and uh, and months thanks to or due to the 
COVID crisis. Perhaps we'll move to the next topic and I will uh, let uh, Cecile speak about uh, the workforce uh, evolution. Yes, thank you, Philippe. Uh, so yes, what you disclose uh, about the impact of automation of uh, new technologies and also the business context we, we face with, uh, with the COVID, um, we certainly lead to, uh, to, uh, to redundancies for, for certain industries. So just to answer a question of the participants, um, the survey we, um, we, uh, we have launched uh, was towards uh, two, uh, two, two, uh, 2000 uh, CEOs and, and HR leaders uh, globally uh, across all industries. Um, so, uh, uh, and so to, uh, what we what we what we what we see uh, is that 70 percent of the workforce is likely to be to be made redundant, so a huge huge percentage. And um, and meanwhile, uh, we will have um, jobs, uh, roles, uh, and also competencies that will evolve in the near future. Uh, and we can assume that uh, in the context we 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 faced. Uh, recruitment uh, will be uh, limited uh, on very specific uh, roles and, uh, and jobs. So in that case, um, this means for organizations to be really able to develop their current workforce, um, both on technical competencies, uh, like on data, on technology, but also on soft skills, um, for instance, on change management, on virtual facilitation, uh, on agility, for sure, uh, and, and on leadership, on, on leadership development. Um, so um, the uh, business leaders and, uh, and HR leaders we, we have interviewed um, say that for us, 35% of, uh, of the workforce could be uh, uh, upskilled. So uh, very significant percentage and very, very significant investment in terms of uh, upskilling and reskilling the, uh, the existing workforce. Uh, at the beginning of the webinar, you, um, you, you have answered a question uh, around the, uh, the composition of the workforce and, and you, you were 45% uh, saying that uh, for you, uh, it will be really a change uh, in the composition of workforce. So um, actually, this, the CHROs uh, share your views. Uh, they are like 50%, half of them um, say that they will need to rethink really their uh, talent sourcing strategy. Uh, and find the right balance uh, between um, uh, the buy, uh, borrow, and, and build uh, strategy. Uh, so when we say buy, it, uh, who I, do I need to recruit? Um, the borrow uh, will be uh, what are the jobs or the roles uh, that will be outsourced to uh, external providers? Uh, and for, for the build, who do I need to upskill? Uh, on which competencies? Um, so really, this is really uh, this full uh, uh, talent sourcing strategy that will be part of the uh, CHRO uh, agenda. And as part of this agenda, they will need also to focus on uh, their own transformation as uh, an HR function to be able to support uh, the business in, uh, in all these changes. Uh, and I will hand over to, to Philippe on the next slide to, uh, to just uh, give uh, some more details on that. Yeah, th thank you, Cécile. Um, and uh, as Cécile said, uh, CHROs will have a, a critical uh, role in this transformation and that we see uh, at our clients and uh, the different organizations we assist in their uh, transformation, uh, uh, let's say, uh, initiative and project. Uh, and, and, and we saw uh, uh, really a change in the way uh, HR were perceived and, and let's say, uh, uh, involved in, in major transformation projects. That's a clear change with what we saw in the 10, 20 past years, and, and we see a lot of major transformation uh, um, transformation project for HR. And that's uh, also a, a key learning of the, the crisis we, we, we faced. Now, in the past, when you had crisis, uh, <laughs> the first project to be cut and, and stop were HR projects. Now it's clearly different, and we even saw a, a, an acceleration of that uh, with a lot of focus on several topics around the HR transformation, and I will come to that. In, in a second. So perhaps let's start first with the, the vision of, of CEOs uh, regarding the HR function. And 60% of the CEO we interviewed consider the HR function being more an administrator and not bringing value. And so it means that we have 40% that consider the, the opposite, but still it's important to consider that now most of the organization consider that the CHROs and their function are not really at the level expected to really support the business transformation. 
What does it mean for CHROs as part of this global uh, transformation they need to support? It means a complete transformation and moving to a new way to manage their processes, their organization, their technology. So we see four priorities for, for CHRO, and I will deep dive a bit on two of them. So first, the employee experience. So really rethinking the way employee will be engage the way they will be supported by HR. And we saw that during the COVID crisis, huh? really HR were in the first line uh, for really supporting employees in the way they had to adapt the way they work. So first, rethinking the interaction and the collaboration with employees and manager, let's say business. Second, rethinking the organization itself because there will be a need for HR to move to a very traditional, very administrative way to manage the, the function to a more advanced, being more data-driven, being more focused on new skills. Cecil mentioned the workforce, uh, workforce strategy, workforce shaping topics. It means that HR need to build new skills to really support business on these critical topics. We, can, we have several examples of that, but I will not deep dive too, too much on that. And focus more on technology and data. That's probably the two critical areas we see for CHROs, really being able to support better the business by providing more insight, And it means by having a data of quality and a good focus on what are the insight and how we will reach um, a better uh, um, way to bring the insight for the business in their decision making process. It can be about uh, strategic workforce planning, of course, as, as Cecil mentioned, but it's also on other topics, huh? how we can predict attrition, how we can really rethink the talent strategy based on, on this insight and attract the best, retain the best, and make sure you have uh, the best workforce for the future. So data, that's a critical area we see at our clients. And on top of that is technology. Hein? Uh, we had a lot of uh, HR clients, HR uh, organizations that had very scattered uh, technologies, hein? not integrated with a lack of automation. And we have seen a drastic uh, move to more integrated platforms, more advanced platform with a, a different uh, experience being provided to, to employees and managers and really supporting the end-to-end -end processes for, uh, for a better HR service in the end. So that's a topic on the HR processes, uh, the usual one, but also service management, for instance. Huh? How we better react to and we better answer to employee requests to have this timely answer to the most urgent needs of managers and employees. And perhaps the last point is uh, also the AI and the uh, robotics that underline all this automation for HR. And I will let Cecile conclude about the service. Yes, so we went to, uh, yeah, to, to, to conclude. And if we should uh, summarize in one sentence uh, the challenges of future of work for, for HR leaders and, and business leaders, actually, uh, it could be make the most of your people and, uh, and their talents. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Cécile and Philippe. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I know that 50% of uh, HR uh, and businesses are uh, rethinking their uh, talent sourcing strategy. Uh, that's quite impressive and quite a challenge. I am now very much uh, looking forward to, hear, to hearing the view of our uh, next guest speakers on that matter. And for that, I'm very happy to welcome Peter Zemski, who will moderate the panel. As you know, Peter is a strategy professor and has served as Deputy Dean and Dean of Innovation at INSEAD since 2013. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Great to be here coming at you live from our Fontainebleau campus. Um, we have a wonderful, not only high powered um, panel, um, but also very diverse. I, I think it's important to have a diverse set of views Um, we're dealing with not only a really important set of topics around what's going to be happening with the workforce, but complicated, multidimensional. Um, we heard from Thomas up front. I think the presentation brought home. We not only have all these currents of, of digital technology automation, but also purpose-driven organizations, both amplified by um, the pandemic. And on top of that, this big new wild card about where work is actually going to happen and the explosion of, of, of work. So we've got Mark Dixon. You guys should turn on your cameras and join me, please. So Mark Dixon, founder and CEO of um, originally Regis, but now IWCG, biggest supplier of workspaces to businesses. 
Um, Carlo, um, president, Microsoft France. You think about Microsoft now, probably the biggest leading supplier of technology and digital to businesses. Um, again, then we have Eckhart Ernst, um, chief macroeconomist for the International Labor Organization. Um, this clearly goes well beyond just the firm level. We have to think about the whole system. So great to have your perspective here. And again, Solen will stay on and, and join us. Um, you've already heard about her. Well, just say in terms of agility, she's calling in from her paniche, very agile on her boat. She can always move if she has to. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we're gonna do the panel in two parts. Um, the first one, we're just gonna dig into this issue of how are technologies impacting jobs and work environments. Um, at, we will have Q&A on this topic. So please keep those questions coming. After we've dug into that, we're gonna look at really zeroing in on what are we gonna do with our workforce to make them more resilient. Um, also the whole labor market, what can we do to, to make the work, the labor market more resilient? Um, okay, Mark, we're gonna, we're gonna go to you. Um, in the workspace business, you're right in the middle of the storm. Um, what, what, what's your view on this first question? I mean, if you could, if everyone could sort of hit me with two to three minutes max, and then we'll make it interactive. Mark, well, please kick us off. Yeah, right, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Peter. Look, work, work is never going to be the same again. I mean, we, we're having this conference on, on Zoom this evening. Um, in a post-COVID world, there's going to be a tremendous transformation. And it's, it's going to be overall a force for good. It's going to, I believe, improve both the environment, people's lives, and it's going to be better for companies. If we just look at people, which is the, really the key driver, very interesting to hear from Cecile and Philippe, on the subject, uh, our research confirms the same thing. You know, it's what people want. They want a hybrid workplace. Not everyone, but at least 50% of the workforce wants to work some of the time at home, some of the time close to home, but come into a head office or a, or a forum where they can interact with colleagues in a physical way. But what they really want is to get two hours of their lives back and they want the productivity that they've been able to gain through using a digital workplace as opposed to going to a physical workplace. Um, for the environment, again, huge improvement over the coming years. People are going to use less office space. Now, I'm in the office business, but you know we've predicted this for the last 10 years, that people will move, office space will move to where people live, not where they're being asked to go. It doesn't make any sense to travel to work for most people in a digital world. And then prop tech, you know, this is on the continuum of the workplace, prop tech giving rich data to companies allows them to have less space. And that's not just having people working from home, that's people working from all types of uh, environments. So for companies, again, just our research also confirms the KPMG's race research there, it halves the cost. So if you're a company, you cannot miss this. It halves cost. It increases productivity and speed of doing business. Done well. Has to be done well. Um, you can access a, a, high, a much wider talent pool in a digital world than in a physical world. And you know, remember, this is what the talent of the future is going to want, that hybrid workplace. So you know, it's going, to, it's going to open up a market of better people for you. So these are powerful drivers. The change is going to come. It's going to come quickly. You've had an enforced trial over the last nine, 10 months. That trial is going to continue up until the summer. And it's worked. You know, the world didn't fall over. And it, it's really there to stay. Thank you, Mark. That's awesome. Two, two quick follow-up questions. Um, again, this pandemic is global. But are you seeing particular, are you expecting changes um, that are more localized? Um, how it might this play out across different regions that you operate in? Or is it this truly global? It's quite an interesting question, Peter. What we see is it's very, you know, there's lots of trends that you can see and how people are working and it's attached somewhat to the size of people's homes. So people, you know, if you go to countries where generally they have small apartments, um, but they live quite close to, to the office, they will, they've come back to the office quickly. The worst affected place in the world is California, parts of Australia, 
homes are large, commuting's bad. So there's a lot of advantage to actually working from home and you've got the space to do it. So there, there is a huge number of very interesting trends that come out of this. Great, last one and then we're gonna move on. Um, again, you've laid out a lot of the ground, but maybe just to look inside IWG. I mean, again, you operate also a, techno a prop tech type approach. Yeah. What's happening to your workforce, your, your, um, your work inside? Our work inside has both speeded up. I mean, we were working on this technology before COVID, but now we're working exclusively on this. So, so much less travel. We do things more quickly. We, are, we have invested, and it's very interesting, going to hear from KPMG, in, in curating a virtual workplace. So, you know, we have drinks to celebrate things, but, you know, we're all in different places. We, you know, you have to, you have to create a, an environment where you can share ideas without it being in a meeting and so on. So, you know, we've gone a lot further into trying to improve the workplace to keep people stimulated, interesting, interested, and to get the best out of people during this difficult time. Okay, great bridge over to you, Carlo. So sitting at Microsoft, um, yeah, what are you seeing with this technology? Um, first of all, about enabling work, and then maybe I'll, I'll probe you a little bit on, on this tech for good topic, but, but just you're, you're enabling all this. How's it going? Yes, look, it has been uh, an incredible experience, actually, and I've been observing, you know, the uh, speed of these um, new attention. I would say that all the organizations are having uh, around technology. Technology has been around, actually, for, for a while, right? Uh, we have been discussing in these last five years, since 2015, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence is the industrial revolution of this century. An industrial revolution is when a production factor comes into play and actually the other factors are reorganized because of the new one, okay? We had steam, we had electricity, we had automation and, uh, and robots, and then we started having technology and now artificial intelligence. Now, COVID-19, I mean, this incredible experience at global level, all the organizations in the world impacted. Everybody's talking about acceleration on the digital transformation and the digital culture of the organizations. Actually, it's an epiphany because CEOs and leaders around the globe are looking at their model of creating value, which is not only work, but it is work of people with goods, with production lines, with supply chains that are maybe more fragile than what we thought. Uh, with uh, innovation capabilities, with uh, creativity, with uh, partnership, et cetera, et cetera. And what do they discover? Well, they discover that their company is not resilient enough, is not flexible enough. Sometimes it's not innovative enough or not fast enough to grasp that. Uh, maybe not productive enough. And uh, if people cannot go to the office, then uh, sometimes you have processes that are disrupted. And actually technology has been there to solve all these issues for quite a long time. And now we run and we try to adopt it. So my, my point would be, I mean, we always need to learn from the past, from previous crises. Of course, we never had such a huge crisis in, at the same time, all of us. But I think this should be the moment of reflection on, hey, maybe the world of tomorrow with the new generation Y and Z coming into play, uh, with technology transforming every industry and every business model, maybe it's really time to take my organization, deconstruct and reconstruct in a different way. Mm. I will always aggregate value to bring my products and services, but maybe the way I'm gonna do it is different. And if you think about the office itself, I'm happy that Mark is working with passion on it. But the concept of office, like I go to a building of my company with an open space, managers observing and so on and so on. This is a concept that has been invented 60 years ago. And who can really tell me why are we still working, organizing the work in that way? I mean, I, that's not the model anymore, but we are still hierarchical, 
we're still office, open space, command and control, controlling what people do and so on and so on. In, in 50 years, it's gonna, it's gonna seem so obsolete. So it's time now to reconceive all this and use technology in a proper manner by uh, protecting people, value of people, work and so on and so on, but reinventing the way we do things. Great, thank you for pushing the conversation forward. Maybe I'll go back to your first part about this you know, AI technology industrial revolution and that the pandemic has really been a moment of truth. Lots of people have been talking about it, but were they ready to move when they had to? Um, again, president of, of Microsoft France, um, maybe what do you what are we seeing in terms of French organizations on average? How have they done well? How has this been a wake up call for them? Where are they lagging? Just a few comments on on. It's on a great French question. This is, this is what I'm discussing <laughs> daily with CEOs in France. Look, some of them I would say they were prepared. Uh, although it was a surprise, they were well organized. They could mobilize their teams quickly to work differently. They could do work from home, remote work, depending on the concept and the uh, how do you apply it very quickly. Uh, their processes were automated enough that they could still control their business pretty well. I'm not saying that they didn't have issue, but the digitization was at a level such that they could manage with a good level of resilience. Some were surprised. They called for help. We could help them, but it took several weeks or months. And some, you know, we are, you know, almost eight year, eight months uh, after that, uh, they're struggling. So they're thinking about, you know, laying off people. So all the situations have been, have been happening. And, you know, look at manufacturing or supply chain. When you see most of the Chinese companies, you know, we never talk about this, but most of the Chinese companies in manufacturing, they didn't really disrupt the production. So they went home, they were controlling everything from home and they could still produce, most of them. So we had some supply chains uh, disruptions, but less than in Europe. So this is and, for discussion. That's yeah? your thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, we're gonna have to, to move on. Um, Eckhart, maybe um, sitting there at, you know, ILO, um, what do you what, what what are you guys talking about? Um, what what what's your view on this particular moment um, and how technology seems to be continuing to disrupt uh, workplace? Yeah, th thank you, Peter, and thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I mean, I want to I would like to take off from, from where Carlo left it and and basically just maybe kind of give a quick uh, thinking about these technological changes. I mean, as, as Carl mentioned, and I think that we probably agree on this on this point, this is really not some, not, not nothing particularly new. Uh, I mean, technolo technological change has been with us for the last uh, 200 years, if you want. Uh, what is maybe different is that it's, it's, it's global, it affects everybody at the same time. And I think that kind of disruption is certainly uh, very special and doesn't happen so often. And I think that the speed at which uh, everybody needed to adjust is maybe, maybe really problematic. Yeah? What is uh, what is clear is that, and I mean, I'm I'm glad to see Cecile and Philip's uh, numbers that, we, that correspond very much to what we also see is that the number of people actually being redundant and made, uh, being made redundant is actually not that high in comparison to the numbers that we have seen in the past. But what does happen is a lot of new tasks and a lot of new uh, new jobs, new new roles need to be filled, and bringing those people who are being re made redundant or even the younger people coming into the labor market into these new jobs will be a real challenge. And I think where I would see, and that's why I would like to throw this into the, the discussion tonight is where I would like to see, see a particular role for this, to this type of new technology that we see is that they not only uh, transform jobs or bring in new roles, but they also help us to organize this process maybe in a much better and much, much more efficient way than, than we have seen in the past. So this, this transformation of the labor market is something that we probably can be able to speed up with, uh, with AI. I, we have conversation also, obviously, with public policymakers, and they're very concerned uh, about um, uh, about these these technological changes. But what I always tell them is that you actually have a role to play here. If you use this technology in such a way that you actually improve 
the way you run uh, uh, your institutions, whether that's public employment services or uh, training centers, etc. You can actually help these companies to imp to make this transition easier and more more efficient. And I think that's something that's an opportunity that this new technology offers us in comparison to what we have seen in, in the last uh, in the last technological revolution so far. And I think we should we should maybe focus on on that one a bit more also in the discussion of how can we make sure that not only big companies like Microsoft uh, can benefit from it, but also all these uh, small and medium-sized enterprises that uh, that are so so important for our for our labor force. My, I'm based, as you know, in Geneva and in Switzerland. SMEs are basically the backbone of the labor market, but these companies often do not have neither the financial means or maybe not even the the the, uh, the capacity to roll out some of, uh, some of these new technologies to improve, for instance, comp uh, strategic talent management, etc. So, what is it that we need to do as uh, as policymakers, but also mm -hmm. as uh, as business association, to bring bring in uh, these new technologies and the benefits of these new technologies to these to these companies as well? Maybe if I could just let me um, add, just to probe on that. What so just to get even more concrete, both on the policy side, what kind of policies are you thinking could help but then also on the business side what's the role of 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 businesses um to to, to make you know this skill transition happen more smoothly well one one uh, one thing i think is what is really important and this it's uh, again cecile and philip talked about this is that uh, the HR function needs to become much more te technical, te technological, if you want. Huh? So for the moment, there's mostly people who have a background in psychology and, 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 and human resource management, but not so much in terms of understanding actually the value of these, of these people in their workforce. So somehow we need to understand actually what the company competent, competence that, that we are, how are these related to other competences on the market? You know, we actually you define a relative, role relatively specifically in one company and nobody knows what that corresponds to in some somewhere else we actually uh, we actually do some work on, on on big data with some of these tech companies and it's actually a hard work to match competences across companies and so so i think here for instance the policymaker could play an, an, a significant role to help standardize a bit these different competence profiles to make it to make this transition much more easy and, and smoother great i will even come back to that more as we work on workforce resilience down the road um so len why don't you uh come in with a uh, few few of your thoughts on our topic. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so on, on, on the impact of tech on uh, jobs and environment, I, uh, I would like to share three main thoughts. Uh, first one is how technology uh, from uh, really change the way um, the, how company can work and be organized. Today, businesses uh, like it's far more with technology. It's far more there is far more complexity. We work now in very networked organization and environment in ecosystem. So there is a very pyramidal model that many organizations still work with. Uh, I think is uh, really don't work uh, anymore. And so, for me, technology really bring uh, a need to change organizational structure to be more uh, certainly more flat with more distributed uh, leadership and also change the leadership styles uh, style uh, towards uh, more uh, so that the leader becomes more enabler of the of the group of his team um, second point i think we a question i have today uh, is we talk a lot and uh, kpmg partners uh, discussed that 17% of the jobs could become redundant. And uh, I think some other uh, uh, surveys are even uh, uh, yeah. higher numbers. So I think there is quite a question about do we need uh, new economical models? Uh, uh, do the current models need mm -hmm. to evolve? So I see three things, for instance, uh, I was quite, quite surprised, like uh, if you heard maybe about uh, the universal basic income. This is something I heard for the first time five years ago and I, from a very uh, socialist friend. And now uh, this model, uh, now McKinsey uh, start to mention it. So I think the Republicans in France also are uh, exploring this option. Uh, so really what are maybe new economical models uh, maybe increase share values. Uh, we see like there are like now like this gig economy is increasing. Um, what new system can accompany this like social protection? Uh, 
And the third point, uh, third point that uh, I, I really feel is important is when we talk about uh, digital shift and technologies, I don't think today we can uh, not link it with a sustainable shift that we are living today. Mm -hmm. uh, both come together. So uh, not only technologies can be uh, uh, force for bad, uh, so we sure make sure it's not the case, but especially technologies can be uh, an enabler of this uh, sustainable shift. And, uh, and so I think this has two impacts. Uh, first, it's also increased pressure, pressure on HR management uh, because a single company won't be able to say, okay, I'm sustainable, I'm green, uh, but my HR practice are, are questionable. So it's more mm -hmm. pressure on management. Uh, and the second, uh, I think this sustainable shift also bring uh, like new jobs. And uh, I think this is also very fascinating. And uh, on that matter, uh, maybe, uh, look at the, like for the agriculture sector for instance i recently attended a conference with bruno parmentier and he was like showing how the sector will completely change uh, with now uh, sensors ai's uh, nanotechnology uh, so the farmer job will be completely different and i think this is very good thank you um actually so uh, we'll take the universal basic income thing up with eckhart in part two so eckhart you can give us your views on that um, just quickly, on you talked about inspiring examples of distributed work. Are, are there particular companies that, just briefly, you find um, inspiring in that space that you look to as positive examples? I, I think we see uh, quite, quite some new like models emerging and sometimes very alternative. Uh, like uh, maybe you heard about uh, the new models like holacracy, sociocracy. Uh, actually, I think a reference book and, uh, is a reinventing organization uh, with our mm -hmm. fellow uh, inside alumni, Frédéric Laloux. And uh, we see more and more of those models emerging. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, there is no one model to replicate, but there are interesting things to learn from that. All right. Um, as I promised, we have, I got to shift to a few, few of the highly voted questions. So maybe I'm going to put Carlo on the spot now. Obviously, there's a lot of scrutiny around big tech these days. Um, maybe not the most on Microsoft, but you guys have had your time under the spotlight. Um, so Benjamin's asking around, you know, just the push for automation and, and the, the negative impacts on jobs. So what sort of the micro, how does Microsoft, who's, you know, a big uh, um, enabler of automation, how, how do you think about job destruction, your role within that? So yeah, it's super, super interesting. I think, um, you know, as you said, the Microsoft, we had our time of uh, <laughs> a radar screen and, uh, and attention from regulators. And I think we are now a much wiser company and we try to uh, adopt a principled approach on ethics, which is pretty unique actually, because, um, you know, in tech goes super fast and the law and regulation, they always come after a problem <laughs> has arisen in the world. And, and this is exactly what is happening on tech. So we see it every day with a lot of uh, you know, news and, and debates and discussions. Are they too powerful? Are they using the data in a way that is appropriate or not? And so on and so on. Good debates, by the way. We're not going into details, but very good details, um, debate. Now, our approach is to say technology has to help humans uh, achieve goals, produce with well-being and happiness, and not destroy value, but add value. It has to stay under our control, has to respect uh, ethics, and in terms of uh, jobs, of course, it will transform every job, by the way. I mean, we're talking about 85% of the jobs of the world. That's why I would also you know, comment on the... 35% I saw before in a chart saying, uh, you know, CEOs and, uh, and, uh, and people officers are thinking about reskilling 35%. I think we should reskill 100% of the workforce because all the jobs are going to change in the next 20 years uh, and everybody deserves to have, uh, you know, a new approach. But again, yeah, overall, we need to uh, create economy equations that are creating value, reducing inequality, uh, you know, um, inequalities and, and producing value for people. Otherwise, why are we producing technology? To remove happiness, to remove well-being? I don't think that's the approach. Now, will we see in the future some jobs that will suffer more than the others sooner? Yes. Do we need 
as companies to be prepared at contributing positively? Yes. And do we need government and regulators to understand the trends and to prepare uh, by discussing with the companies, by transforming the education system and making sure we are preparing the uh, workforce, work of, workforce of the future as a future-proof workforce, rather than producing the same skills as 10, 20, 50 years ago, and then saying, oh my God, I'm producing skills and then they are jobless. Well, yeah, but are we producing the skills that we need for the future? So this is a big equation. Of course, we can contribute as a company and we do on the debate, on discussing with every client, discussing with the government. But I think it has to be really a, a, a kind of a societal uh, movement and one company alone can, cannot do it. What we are trying to do is to uh, behave as a company and also to aggregate all the other tech companies into ethical approach around mm-hmm. artificial intelligence. And we founded this group with you know, now Google, Apple, Amazon mm-hmm. are all participating, IBM. And that's good because at least we start mm-hmm. writing down what is the common ground of the ethical approach to AI that we should have. Mm-hmm. No, anyway, I, I certainly think, I mean, given the history of Microsoft, you can help that tech ecosystem hopefully adapt faster. Progress, very yeah. interesting. Um, Mark, I want to go over to you. Again, if you want to jump on that topic, um, I know you have some views there, but just I also want to mention there's a couple of additional questions on the location of work that you might also want to jump on. So Isabel, I mean, so one of the issues is who's going to get all this savings when companies save the money How much do we think is actually going to go to workers to pay for maybe a home office and some of the expenses that go with us? And and also, I think um, Patrick has a question also around just norms of working. What does it take for people to give up their desk, their office, and actually concretely, how do we shift that culture so that even some of our our higher end um, talent is willing to share space? Um, Anyway, Mark, I, I know you've got lots of views. Um, jump in on any of those questions. Look, I think I think um, this sort of sharing of space becomes the norm. I mean, in in the world that we live in, um, you know, th- people don't think twice about you know ha- renting a car at an airport. It's a shared car. Uh, you know, they get jump on a plane. It's a shared seat on a plane. Um, so sharing workspace, whether it's within a company or um, whether it's in a hybrid workplace or a flexible workplace, um, you know, sort of becomes the norm. Who gets, there's a very interesting policy question that's going to come out in terms of people working from home. And it's a lot of it's to do with insurance and, you know, added costs at home, even though they're small. Um, what we've seen is quite a few companies making allowances for people working from home, small allowances. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot of um, a lot of companies innovating in this area, um, and 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 improving home workplaces. I mean, that's we've launched a business which is supporting home workers. Their biggest problem is back problems because they haven't got the right seats, and they're sitting at the kitchen table. They haven't got a an up and down desk and things like this. So, um, you know, as the change takes place, I think companies are going to have to adapt. A lot of work for, for HR. Um, overall, though, it, it's what people want. In our own company, um, we've been able to hire fantastic people all year. Um, we have done a lot more splitting of jobs. We've been able to do and hire, again, can we, you know, to hire three people rather than one who all are working from home, very talented people. They don't want a full-time job. They want... They, they work in a team of three. So a lot of that uh, has changed over the period. Can I just follow up on that? Um, you know, going back to this purpose and, and this, the, this sort of SDG moment, what is this remote working going to do towards inclusion? So um, in terms of the ability to spread economic opportunity out, you know, outside of Paris and London and, and some of these things. Well, Do you have gonna, a view on that? It's going to create a a sort of flatter opportunity world. So, you know, to get a great job, you won't necessarily have to, you know, leave where you live and go into one of the bigger cities 
it's going to reverse that to an extent. And we've seen that. I mean, if you if you try and buy or rent a country home in, in Britain today or in France, it's quite difficult because everyone's left the cities and gone to the country. Much better quality of life. And you, you know, you don't have to come to the office every day for once. So um, it will even things out. Very important, again, is to rejuvenate sort of the commuter towns, you know, formerly called dormitory towns. They will become very vibrant places in five years' time. That's the effect of digital. You, know, you, 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 you better get a great job from wherever you are. And it will open up the workplace. So maybe I think there will be a lot more people that work part-time, which is what they want, um for, for their own reasons and so you get more people working but they maybe do less hours and uh, we're certainly seeing that and that you can do in a digital world you know when you're not when they're not having to come into the office that's that's an easy thing to do thank you very much um maybe eckhart and so well eckhart maybe first um as you listen to the questions and the answers when you, as, as a macroeconomist sitting at a labor organization, um, what, what are your reactions to the questions and, and the answers we've had so far? No, absolutely fascinating discussion. I mean, what, the, the one thing I would add maybe to what Mark was just saying is that the big, the big elephant in the room is obviously what happens to remuneration strategies of companies. Uh, we had this discussion last week actually with uh, people from the uh, HR people from the US. And, uh, and clearly, if you, if you hire uh, out of San Francisco, but people living in Arkansas or so, you don't, you don't need to pay the same, the same amount of money. And the question is, uh, do, you, do you continue trying to attract talent on the basis of salaries you pay in San Francisco? Or you basically say, well, no, I mean, I don't have to pay that as much money. And that's mm. actually, I, I add to that. So I think that's, that's, uh, that these kind of debates will come. And then obviously, uh, as, as Mark was mentioning, if people are living more in, in maybe rural France or so, some, some urban planning will be in place, you know, maybe new infrastructure need to be built over there. I think, again, it's, a, it's also a role for the policymaker and regulator to come in. And that, and maybe that's, just a riff on that to bring it back to the French example. So you think about France, fairly high tax area, high social charges. Suddenly, if all my meetings are happening over Zoom, it gets a lot, could get a lot easier to locate um, work outside of France, is that the, is that a is that a potential shock coming to the system? Do you think or? Well, we see that to a certain extent. I mean, I would say I'm a bit less less uh, optimistic that we can really all, all work over gig platforms in, in the future. I think that the the, the increase in uh, in uptake on these platforms is not that dramatic. There are certain tasks you can easily uh, 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 trade over the gig platforms, but I mean, a lot of things to still require. Uh, uh, one on one, at least virtually, uh, and so I think. Right. So I mean, what I mean, what we're seeing again is yes, it's half the time at home, but it's still half the time in the office, which yes. which will keep things more local. I mean, again, which matters as well for these big ecosystems like the Bay Area, um, like like Berlin or whatever, um, whether you can completely delocalize. Interesting. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the danger, obviously, is that you create some kind of segmented uh, 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 workforce. Huh? So you have the, the, those who kind of live close by, they can interact regularly, they get the networking, etc. And then you have those who basically do your, your menial tasks, your programming tasks that you can do uh, maybe somewhere else and, and who, are, who are kind of further away from from also from uh, from uh, talent uh, talent management strategies that companies have, uh, and again, that's a that this is a debate that is currently also uh, taking place. How I mean, Apple actually had this discussion recently. How to bring, how do you bring people in that are further away and who don't have this network in in uh, in Mountain View? Uh, so I think these are these are these are new HR questions that actually people need to kind of take more serious in the future. If, um, if, so Len, any um, before we, we're going to have to move to the second topic in, in just a couple of minutes, but did you want to jump in? on these questions. Uh, no, maybe simply, uh, we, we did an event with the Future of Work Club um, on uh, remote work, and notably with Rodolphe Dutel, who's uh, developed uh, remotive.io, uh, which is, um, and he's connecting businesses who want to work 100% remotely. And so they have quite some uh, interesting uh, HR practices, which has really dedicated to full remote work and uh, it's good insight. Okay, so now um, as we, we move towards the second half of the panel, um, I really want to think about our workers. You know, the, 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 how do we take the, the people that work in these organiz our organizations experiencing all this change? As, as Carlos said, maybe 100% of them are going to need new skills 
over the coming years, how do we better support these people in, in a very disorienting time? Um, it's difficult for a lot of people. How, how can we as companies and as, as people who are part of the whole system make this transaction go better? Um, Eckhart, I'm gonna put that tough topic on you. You've already touched a, a bunch on your ideas. Um, again, I would just flag what Solen said, what's your view um, in there on universal basic income? Is that part of it? Um, how does that do for incentives? Um, please kick us off on this topic. Yeah, thank, thank you, Peter. I mean, I think the first thing I would want to say about this is, I mean, re resilience has become now the new buzzword, obviously, uh, since, the, since the crisis. So, and, and I think people don't realize what it actually implies. Um, because, I mean, really, when you talk about resilience, what you mean by that is uh, you need to leave money on the table to survive, which is to say that you actually need to trade in some efficiency gains from the past. I mean, globalization, we talk about deglobalization, means that we have less efficiency gains from from. Uh, uh, from globalization, we talk about uh, having a broader skill set, which means that you're actually less specialized in, in, the, in the job that you're doing. So, I mean, and I think it's, it's, it's important to keep that in mind that there are some there that we have to rethink maybe the trade offs that we have uh, done in the past and take into account that we face con continuous shocks, whether it's a crisis, uh, uh, um, uh, health crisis, whether it's a climate crisis, uh, I mean, uh, social, social shocks that we have seen in the past, etc. I think that it's important to take this into mm -hmm. account uh, when we when we adjust that my point i mean i would i would want to add two policy uh, aspects here the one is um, we have been talking about lifelong learning since the 80s at least and we still haven't solved that problem huh? and partly we haven't solved that problem is we haven't figured out how to bring skills to those uh, how to bring a totally new skill to those people who are already in the workforce i mean it's teaching young kids or uh, young students it's it's an easy easy way huh? but people at my age i still have 20 years to go and you train me as a medical doctor now it's impossible i mean it's I mean, even if I wanted to, it's impossible. Huh? So how do you do that? Huh? And I think that's that problem we haven't really solved. How to actually uh, incentivize people, but also how to bring them, give them the a the right ed educational institutions, the right orientation to where is this actually useful for them to reskill themselves, and what's the future opportunities. And and the third, obviously, the third element is to what extent we can give them some tax credits, some benefits, some, somehow to kind of get, bridge that gap for that uh, for that period. And in this respect, I mean, UBI could be one one answer to that, obviously, uh, to to actually give everybody as minimum uh, uh, living uh, living opportunity. But we but even if you do that, you still haven't solved the problem of the value of work. I think that it's it's really important that. UBI is only useful if we really kind of create purpose for people to find stuff to do with their, with the, the time that they actually have at the disposal. It's not to say, well, I give you the money, sit in front of your TV, don't bother me. That's not working. Uh, and, and we have seen that, you know, the, all this political uh, stress that we have seen in some countries, that's part of the, of, of the problem. So I think that we, we need to go beyond this pure money aspect and kind of really recreate purpose. And I think that's, I mean, I actually very pleased to hear that that this is now uh, a, a much more broader uh, focus for, for many companies to actually create this, create this purpose and create a purposeful organization, which we, because I think that is indeed the way forward for, uh, for our societies. Very nice, thank you. Again, as a uh, also French and US citizen, I, I can definitely say giving more people to sit in front of the news and just watch that might not be the best thing, but we, we won't go there. Carlo, I'm gonna pivot to you. I know you probably prepared some thoughts on this, but I'm quite interested on what, what, what Eckhart brought up around learning and resilience. When I think about Microsoft and the culture shift there, um, you guys have done a lot, both internally on building a learning organization and, 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 and of course, then also um, being a, a force for good around education more generally. But anyway, so interested in your general thoughts on this, but, but super curious about the learning piece for you. Look, when Satya came on board in 2014, uh, he has been talking about growth mindset and humility. And I think that the cultural transformation he has done in just six years, uh, and I can uh, you know, uh, see it from the inside, is, is, is really amazing. Mm -hmm. And you know, he said, we need to go from know it all people to learn it all people. And it was not just a, sen you know, a sentence for cultural change. He was a reality that has been going on and on and on and on for six years now. Mm -hmm. The number of hours of training that we have, we all have, uh, independent, I mean, it's independent from the job you have. It's, you, ha you can have some specific training for the job, 
but you also have some mandatory training for all of us. It's I've never studied so much. And <laughs> I've never studied so much. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's days and days of training. And it's a huge investment. And then three years ago, yeah, right, yeah, three years ago, exactly. We had a discussion with Satya and with my, uh, we are 14 executives in charge of the areas of the world. And we said, Satya, I mean, the work we're doing internally is great. But once we retrain all of us, what about our ecosystem of partners and what about our clients? He said, what do you, what do you guys mean? Well, what we mean is that we should be more generous and actually everybody has to learn the same thing that we're learning because you know, tech is going to impact you know, most of the jobs in the world. And so that was the beginning of a discussion that, that later led to Microsoft opening programs in every country to reskill partners and to work with end clients on their reskilling pro programs. We invest money, we certify people, and more recently, just because of this COVID uh, disruption that is also creating unemployment, we decided to, put, to publish for free uh, thousands of hours of learning from Microsoft Learn and uh, LinkedIn on soft skills and GitHub. Uh, this is, you know, all 2021 will be for free. And so any kid, any unemployed person, anybody who wants to, you know, create a little bit more of technical knowledge, you have access to resources. It doesn't replace, you know, all kinds of education. I'm not saying that, but you can go from some skills to a lot of skills to certifications. And it is an opportunity. In France, I would conclude on that, we are also, since 2018, we invented this AI school, which is seven months of education and so on, coding and developing and understanding algorithms and so on and so on. And then 12 months of professionalization. So you go and have a job for one year. And we, in 2020, we had 23 promotions, which is a lot. We are co-investing with clients, with partners, with regions. And, and our ambition is to go to 40 uh, promotions in a couple of years. So it means, you know, hundreds of people. And the demonstration we're doing is that these are, I mean, these are not technical people that have been working in IT for 20 years. This is people that know a little bit of mathematics and statistics. They can uh, relate well to others that they are willing to learn, willing to communicate and collaborate. They have done maybe some coding like web development, these kind of things, and they're willing to invest in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what? For, for now, 100% employment at the end of this school. So, and this also to answer a question from Jocelyn on the audience who was saying, do we need to uh, apply reskilling only for those who are, are going to have a job or also for those that are going to lose a job? Now, actually, we should be mindful of everyone and give opportunities to everyone. All right. Thank you. Um, we are going to now go to Mark. Uh, why don't you uh, give your views on uh, this broad topic of resilience? And I'll, I'll leave it wide open for you, okay. um, whatever Look, you want to tackle it. It's really interesting for me, Carlo, there, because um, you know, for us, running a company, we operate in 120 countries in this sort of digital world that we're in, sort of totally virtual. Um, the challenge for us has been to, to make sure that we don't get too much churn of our key people. We, and we've had to, you know, where we'd normally do it through meetings and we'd normally do it through conferences and so on. Um, you know, we get that level of communication. We've had to focus much more on communication, on much more training, digital training, um, on much more curation and, and focus on the workplace from our HR team to make sure that people are clear on their purpose. They are communicated to about how the, how the company's doing, how they are doing and, and finding gaps. And all of this we've done um, you know, sort of in a, over a, a, a digital platforms of one kind or another. And we've done, I think the result has been, we've done a better job at engaging with people than we did pre-COVID. It's, it's been very interesting using digital platforms. Um, and, you know, overall, the surprising, we've had very good response. We've had 
you know, we've been focused on people's emotional state in particular with more people working from home, more people working, our people working in difficult um, circumstances, keeping buildings open and so on uh, in all circumstances. And, uh, you know, it's been, been quite an amazing uh, result in terms of our employee and team member satisfaction uh, and so on. But um, so a lot of learnings for us. Um, I think at the end of hopefully coming to the end of the crisis, we, we've got a whole new way of working that we think will set us up well for the future. Just one final comment. During the last year, we've hired people, trained them, and really got you know, some fantastic contribution from them without ever seeing them around the world. And uh, our HR team mentioned this to me. She's just, this has been an amazing thing. We'd, we'd never have thought of doing that before. And um, it's now become the norm and they get better and better at it. Um, okay, so let me just gonna pick, I'm now gonna pick up some questions coming in from the audience. So one picking up on that from Damien, um, for all the panelists, but maybe Mark first, any, any more things you want to share about how you manage and keep people connected in this environment? You know, especially, you know, this decrease in social interactions. Um, what is it that, that we can do to help nourish people and support people as, as there's less um, physical connection? It's communication. I mean, you don't just use your, we use Microsoft Teams, you know, we're on it all day, the whole company, I think. Um, uh, and I've got a few comments on that, Carlo, by the way. He's changed it. And it it's not been working in the last couple of days. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, it's about um, make, giving people a feeling of belonging. Do your Teams meetings, make them quick, and they tend to be very fast, but then spend time actually meeting people one-to-one, -one, how are you doing, getting groups of people, and, you know, having some drinks, maybe having some canapes, some aperitif, something but just to do something social with no agenda and just ask people the sort of things you would have done if you've been standing in a pub or a bar, you know, what, what, you know, what new things have you been doing in your life? Um, to hear about some joyful things as opposed to just business. And, and it's that, but you have to work at it. It's not, you know, those, the natural do you want to go for a drink, group of people, celebration, all these things are missed. And uh, it's creating a feeling of belonging in a digital world. Really, really important. Maybe I'll push uh, Carlo on that. So what do you, I mean, again, you've got a lot of relationship people in Microsoft France who must be suffering a bunch. How do you, how do you help your people with this, this moment? Look, we had to change completely, um, and it's interesting the examples that Mark is giving. We changed the communication, we changed the concept itself of leading a team and and, and, and of collaboration. So a couple of times, so in during spring and in the fall as well. So in parallel with the two moments of lockdowns, let's cross fingers that we don't have another one, but let's see. Uh, the first one was a surprise, and we had to re-establish what are the good rules of collaboration uh, in an all virtual uh, world. Because yeah, of course, we were heavy users of Teams before COVID, but I have to say that it was a, a great experience for us to use it 100% of our day and week. <laughs> and so we had to re-establish really the rules of collaboration, which is basically, I will give you some examples. Do not uh, plan for a meeting with many people before 9 a.m and after 6 p.m. because you don't know how much you're disrupting the life of your colleagues. Uh, same thing for the for lunch. We need one hour and a half to prepare, to have lunch, to make sure we have uh, families agreements and so on and so on. So then on one one, you can agree on something else, but on one too many, these are the rules. So we had to reestablish the time frame for collaboration. We reestablished the importance of reducing the time of a meeting as much as we can if it is to inform, to report, to, uh, you know, I, let's, let's do it super short, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, exceptionally, and more than one hour has to be like a oh, big reason. And in that case, it's pre-work, pre-reading, and then work 
outcomes minutes. So seems basic, but actually we, I mean, when you work in a different context, what you also need to redefine the rules. So we did it in spring, we had to redo it in the fall because confinement is even longer. People were even less comfortable. And so we had to add, for example, you know, all the care uh, good practices, which is how do you start a meeting? How do you uh, ping somebody just to, as Mark was saying, just uh, uh, simulating the coffee machine, which is just, hey, I want to know how are you, how are you feeling? Uh, in the last meeting, I saw you didn't participate as much as uh, usual. So just a ping and Teams call and then discussion, plus all the informal meetings, breakfast in the morning, aperitif in the evening, no agenda. We just meet. Some In some cases, we also do like inviting people randomly. So it's really another simulation of coffee machine, which is, uh, it's not a meeting, it's just a, a, a room and you get in and then you just discuss with people that you don't know. So Carlo, thank you. Uh, super important, I know all of us leading people are, are really thinking how we can rise to this moment. Um, Eckhart, I, I've got one other, one last question from the audience, a little very different topic, quite challenging, quite important. It's around just how we think about in some ways the social contract, the contract between companies, society, individuals, really around, again, there are all these benefits coming from technology, all these savings, all the, we're, we're, we're better off, and yet how are they getting shared out? And, and again, this, this issue about inclusion, but also inequality. Um, and any hope that, that we're gonna get some sort of systematic thinking about the contract among these, these stakeholders? Well, I, th I think, I mean, I, I, I actually, I'm personally very optimistic in general, but I mean, on this point, on this uh, particular issue, I would be optimistic as well, especially for the reasons that were mentioned or before. I think that p companies are moving towards purpose, uh, purpose organization, purpose driven organization, ESG, uh, SDGs, you mentioned the SDGs yourself are, are, are now in everybody's mind. And I think we are moving into that direction. Obviously it's a slow move. It, it will take some time. We will have to figure out new ways of, of sharing the benefits. I think one important benefit to be shared is that we need to make sure that everybody can benefit from these technologies in their workplace and uh, uh, and at home. And I think that's for the moment is still not there. I mean, uh, there might be there might be issues of connectivity. I mean, infrastructure is not everywhere available to the same extent, etc. I think that these are these are issues that we need to need to tackle. Um, and then uh, the broader then the broader inequality issues, as you said. Uh, I think that here we have we have uh, uh, maybe uh, rethink to have to rethink about our tax benefit system uh, in a way that we, as as Roland was mentioning before, we're bringing in maybe UBI as one possibility. Uh, to that, but I think that what makes me optimistic about we actually have a debate now on these issues. I think before we didn't even we didn't even recognize it as an issue. Now we recognize it as an issue. I actually have to run off in a, into another call in, in ten minutes uh, with, with the IMF of all places who thinks about these issues as well. Inclusive growth is an issue for them as well. And I think that that makes me in a sense optimistic that we are we are reaching a point where we where we think about these issues. We haven't reached a consensus, but we think about these issues and we try to move forward to bring everybody on board because we recognize this as an important as an important point all right we need to start moving towards a wrap-up so i think let's build on eckhart's uh, comments uh if you've got a few thoughts maybe solen first what makes you optimistic and or what what call to action do we need so that we get optimistic outcomes um solen Uh, what makes me optimistic is the discussion we had today and that uh, maybe I'm not sure we would have had uh, maybe if, uh, 10 or five years ago. Uh, and also working in tech, I see really uh, how tech can really enable uh, new models, uh, new business. And, uh, and, uh, Great. Uh, Mark, uh, seem a pretty positive guy. What, uh, what keeps you positive? <laughs> and uh, anything, though, that we call to action for the NCL alumni to, to make sure we get good outcomes? Well, I think, look, it's a, look, I've been in business for many, many years. It's always been a time of change, but I've seen more change in the last 12 months, the last nine months, 10 months in particular. Um, and I think it's, I think it's actually a powerful good. I think, look, for our own company, we're very interested in the environment. And, you know, I think overall, when um, things get back to normal, the lasting change will be this fundamental change to the way people work that will be better for people better for the environment and better for companies and if I, I, so for the environment environmental side um I, 
you know, I, I'm very optimistic that there's there's a new world coming where digital, the promise of digital is actually delivered. And I agree with Eckhart, as, you know, it's not going to happen until governments force companies to actually get the internet to every house. Uh, you know, fiber to every house will will open the market up. Right. I think I think for ourselves, we have a better company at the end of this period. And I think we have a whole new way of doing business that will help us grow. And we're a fast growth company. It's going to help us grow more quickly. It allows us to solve our biggest problem, which is, and again, most CEOs I speak to, their biggest problem is getting enough good people. And you've sort of, you've got a whole new market. You know, the barriers, the boundaries have been changed. And, and it's not just about outsourcing to cheaper uh, places. It, this is about actually being able to find the right talent and, and, and bring them in. This is, so I'm, I am optimistic. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Carlo, you've got the last word, but if it could be a sound bite, that would be helpful. So I'm going to be super short. I'm optimistic because of the young generation of talents that is going to join the workforce. <laughs> they are more mature, more prepared, more aware, more responsible than we were when we were 20 something. I love their approach. We need to create the right context for them to give value in the organizations of today right. and they will help us invent the organizations of tomorrow. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone for a super lively discussion, um, awesome. Um, I'm gonna bring in um, the president of the French NAA, Jean-Marc, why don't you come in uh, with a, as we, as we wrap this up. Thank you, Peter. It has been uh, an amazing panel with our uh, friends around here, Mark, Eckhart, Solène, Carlo. Really, thank you very, very much. And Peter, thanks for facilitating this. It has been a, a real journey into the, the, the future of work powered by technology and yet uh, by human. And that's very important as the future of work is defined. I hope we can have a, a, a next essential session of that caliber uh, in the future. But before we, I hand over back to Thomas, who has organized all the previous uh, Inside Essentials, I wanted to say a big thank you to Thomas Bittner. Uh, he's been having a, a long-standing volunteer role in the Association of Inside Alumni. He's been, um, for six years, my, my second hand and my director general, delegué, uh, he's been for the past three years the, the president of the Association of INSEAD Alumni in Paris, in France, and he's been doing a great job, a great job, thank you, Thomas, by setting up these series of totally digital INSEAD Essentials. So uh, again, a big round of applause. I don't know if you can hear all the applause of uh, everyone. <laughs> all the participants to this uh, essential series. But Thomas, really, really big thank you. You have uh, other projects now, and uh, I look forward to having you again with us in the association to facilitate, build, and set up the next round of Inside Essentials. I count on you for that, and the entire association thanks you and counts on you as well. Thank you, Thomas. You're on mute, Thomas, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jean-Marc. It's difficult to have takeaways in sort of three minutes of such a, a, an amazing, an amazing discussion. Um, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. Um, uh, when we, when, when KPMG presented their, 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 their work, uh, we talked about 17, percent of the workforce is redundant, 35 percent upscaling. Later on, Carlo said it's 100 percent of the workforce who has to be reskilled. Um, and, and they talked about, that was interesting, about buy, borrow, and build, which, which we all know is a, is a book of a professor of, of, uh, of INSEAD, and, and it's a very interesting approach to it. Um, Work is not never going to be the same again, and I was disappointed, Mark, because you didn't say a sentence which we discussed in the in the preparation, which is 
our 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 workplace is is in the cloud and because the workplace is in the cloud it has a huge impact on everything we're going to do and um, uh, and 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 that was another point which we discussed all that um, we also had we also heard uh, that tech companies have to become more ethical which uh, which which i believe was a, a very important point and, and and at that moment said um, carlo said we have to be skilled 100% of our of our workforce um, and um, uh, lifelong learning uh, wh what are we doing with lifelong learning was the point also and insead has done a huge effort on lifelong learning for the last 5 10 years uh, in fact uh, sponsored by by uh, uh, Peter a lot, and um, uh, we have to train. There are people, as we have to reskill people. There are people, and you know, how do you reskill older people, and and how do you do that? And that was another point which we um, uh, which we discussed. Um, uh, Mark said, you know, one of the point was how do you reduce churn? Um, how do you and and the, he talked about digital platforms and, and the importance of digital platforms. Um, a very important, interesting point or a point I took, I took was, how do you simulate a coffee machine? You know, uh, and uh, there was a discussion and Mark, I think was discussing that a lot, pushing it a lot. How do you optimize communication? Uh, how do you optimize communication, which is like an aperitif, like a beer, like a pub, whenever they open again, and don't forget that this is important. So the takeaways were just amazing. I'm not sure I, I, I gave all the, 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 the depth of what we heard, but it was just a superb, a really superb uh, uh, evening. I just want to add a few things to thank all of you, obviously, to thank all of the panel, to thank Peter, who has been as dynamic as always. I will come back to Peter in one second, but before that, maybe next slide. Um, um, I, I want to talk about, uh, I, I want to thank you also about, K, obviously, the sponsorship of KP, KP, uh, KPMGs. Um, you have seen, you know, the, the four uh, elements of our uh, essential series. Um, we are, we're having a publication of that to come out soon in the next few weeks. And it will be sent to all of the participants and to all of the alumni of INSEAD and obviously to all of you, all of you panelists and of speakers, which is going to be the very best of INSEAD Essentials with the help. We're doing that with the help of KPMG, which is going to be superb. And we are uh, already working on next year's Essentials. And, um, and, and Peter has already accepted that and we'll do that also with our Wharton colleagues, where, as you know, there is there is a, a, an association and alliance with Wharton on the future of business education. And so thank you very much you know, for this fantastic evening and uh, have, have a good evening. And let's meet again in spring for the future of business education. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, KPMG. You're very welcome. Thank you. Take care. Bye all. Bye bye. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everyone. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.